musicians, Red Alert, everything's about to change. Atmos is the new standard that your listeners want. You're going to have to upgrade your speakers, your headphones, your audio interface, your VST plugins, and you're probably going to have to buy a Mac. And you might just have to take everything that you know about mixing and engineering and throw it out the goddamn window. And if you can't afford to do all that, then get richer. Music fans, I have some great news. Technology has finally allowed you to listen to music the way that your favorite musicians want you to hear them in immersive 3D sound with Dolby Atmos. And all you need to do is switch or upgrade streaming services by somewhere between 7 and 40 speakers and a new receiver. And of course, you're going to want to have a room in your house that fits Dolby's specifications, and you're always going to want to sit in the exact same spot when you listen to music. But otherwise, you're not listening to music the way that it's meant to be heard, and that is you. Now, before we dive in and open this here can of worms, I noticed that a lot of times when somebody criticizes Atmos, the goalpost just keeps moving or their credibility is doubted. So I'm just going to say it. If you are heavily invested in Dolby Atmos, this video probably isn't going to make you happy, and I'm sure YouTube is recommending you other videos that will validate your investment. Or watch this instead. So anyway, immersive audio is definitely not new to me. If you've been a subscriber of this channel for a while, then you've probably watched me go to insane places to archive three-dimensional soundscapes of natural environments. I've written and mixed a lot of immersive scores for lots of crazy sound systems, some of which you can experience yourself if your local planetarium is licensed dome films that I've done the audio and music for. In addition to this, I've been to Atmos mixing rooms and studios, and yeah, it is cool stuff. I absolutely hate doing this part of the video where I have to validate myself for the viewer, but otherwise, why would you listen to me? But it really just feels like I'm bragging and I fucking hate it. The big elephant in the room for most musicians is that the majority of our fans are listening to music on devices that can't even reproduce bass sounds under 150 hertz. Music producers are trying to be sonic perfectionists, while music consumers, well, at least the majority of music consumers, with some exceptions, they're putting something on to talk over or while they're cooking dinner. And as musicians, it hurts our ego a little bit, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. A really good, solid, objective reason to not mix your music in Atmos is because nobody is going to hear it the way that it's meant to be heard any more than they do now with your stereo mixes. And what's worse, to me personally at least, it reeks of financial gatekeeping and poor shaming. I don't want to ever give you the impression that you need to invest more money and equipment to listen to my music properly. If however you're listening to music makes you happy, then you are listening to it perfectly. I'm going to take a deep breath. And I'm gonna give Atmos a chance because immersive audio does seem a lot more useful in film and television and gaming. And I'm not going to approach it as a sound designer or an engineer or a music producer. I'm going to tell you about how it all works on both a technical and business level. And then I am going to approach it as a consumer. This video has no sponsorships or ties at all. And I have about a $1,300 out of pocket budget. Acoustic physics can get complicated really fast, and you'd think that it would be rather simple in comparison to other areas of science. Sonic pressure or sound is made by something, and then human with two head microphones receive the sound. Obviously, there's a lot more to it than that, but the crazy theoretical part comes in with psychoacoustics, how and why your brain perceives sound the way it does, and how it turns it into useful information, and how your two head microphones can effortlessly know when something is behind or in front, above or below them, using insanely subtle differences in time between the two ears, or volume or reflections. And really, any immersive or spatial audio technology is trying to hack millions of years of evolution to trick your brain to think that you're hearing a place that you're not actually present in. Unless you're in VR or a planetarium dome where the goal is 100% immersion, I think that this is actually fundamentally flawed. And this might explain why, even though surround sound has been around in one way or another since the 1940s, the vast majority of people in America and Europe still use the speakers on their television sets. The metaverse, 3D TVs, surround sound, curved TVs, HoloLens, Google Glass, whatever AR thing that Apple's about to announce. All of these things excite us when we first hear about them, but maybe at the end of the day, we just wanna keep a casual and convenient relationship with the content that we consume. Most people watching this have heard of Atmos, but they don't know what Atmos is exactly, and that's because it's marketed to you as an ambiguous technology that makes your sound better. 
Atmos is a patent and trademark that refers to a proprietary audio delivery format that functions inside the encoding and decoding process of a file. Very similar to the encoding and decoding that happens with an MP3 file or a QuickTime file or a Windows Media Player file. I want to be clear in pointing out that while Dolby Atmos uses immersive three-dimensional audio, it is one of the very many different technologies and encoding formats that does this, and it is far from the first one. Spatial audio, or when I read it, I always think spatial audio, is a term that has been most recently adopted and coined by Apple that originally described three-dimensional audio. And I'm kind of annoyed by this as spatial audio existed for a long time before it became Apple spatial audio. So now, even in this video, when I'm trying to refer to a general umbrella term, you may mistake it for stuff Apple has patented. So I'm going to just call it immersive audio. Simply put, immersive audio is Ideally, if you were to put on blindfolds, it would sound like you're there. There are two different types. There's channel-based audio and object-based audio. Channel-based audio is probably how you're hearing this video. Basically, a file has different channels and those channels are assigned to different speakers, in this case, left and right. In most formats, it's almost as if the audio file is just holding a bunch of audio files within it that are synchronized. So in Adobe Surround Sound 5.1 setup, you would have six speakers and six channels. You'd have a front center channel, front right, front left, rear right, rear left, that's five channels, and then the point one is the subwoofer. 7.1 adds channels in between, and if you had a 5.1.2 system, that last point two would be adding two top layer speakers, which could be mounted to your ceiling or allegedly reflected down from it. So a 7.2.4 system would have a total of 13 audio files going to seven satellite speakers, two subs, and four ceiling. Wow, can you believe that this hasn't been adopted by people who just want to watch TV or listen to music? So that is channel-based audio. Object-based audio is a completely different animal. Each sound source is an independent object, and those objects have metadata that tells the decoder its location, volume, and where it's headed. And frankly, it's an incredible leap in how audio is processed. An object-based decoder is essentially running a lightweight simulation engine. There's no doubt that it is awesome and impressive. And then somewhere in between the two, theoretically at least, there's ambisonic audio, which is what I use in my field recording adventures. So my ambisonic setup uses only four microphones, but it can recreate environments I'm recording with a much higher precision than you could with a normal four-channel recording. And higher order ambisonics can increase the accuracy exponentially. I am very into weird audio stuff. Phonons, sound cannons, acoustic levitation, but I personally can't think of anything in that space that is more fascinating than ambisonics. And that is because the entire system exists as a precise psychoacoustic hack using complex algorithms cataloging spherical harmonics. Easily, out of everything in this video, it is by far the most impressive and reproducible scientific magic trick, and it's been around since the 1970s. But technology, while fascinating, obviously isn't very useful if it isn't practical, and the whole proposed point of object-based sound is to adapt immersive audio to any and all speaker systems and head positions. And if that can't be accomplished, then it might be more efficient to simply use the old-school channel-based decoding. Atmos uses both object-based audio and channel channel-based audio, and it refers to the channel-based channels as beds, and it's limited to 128 channels total, with the maximum number of beds within that being 10. So if you have a 9.1.2 speaker system and want to watch something that is mixed on the older Dolby Surround standard, two of those channels will have to be sacrificed. I'm gonna guess that this probably isn't an issue for most home theaters, but for public theaters where dozens of speakers are being used, part of me wonders if the 10 bed channel limitation exists solely to strong arm movie studios to use and license Atmos. But from a general perspective, it's hard to find something to complain about, unless you're an audiophile, because DTSX is a competing format that has twice the bitrate and unlimited channels. It is technically superior to Atmos. Why most people watching this have never heard of DTSX? Well... <laughs> So a few years ago, a marketing agency reached out to me and asked me if I would be interested in being filmed while mixing the album I was working on in Dolby Atmos. And I know that there's an artist spotlight program from Dolby where artists drop their jaws in amazement while hearing their music in Atmos for the first time. And I just really didn't entertain the offer enough to find out how much money was involved or what it all entailed. One thing I do not want to do in this video is insinuate that Dolby Labs didn't put a lot of research or time into Atmos or any of their other projects. 
they certainly did, but all of this work goes to waste if there is an adaptation, and since their business model profits from licensing, some level of force feeding will have to take place. At the end of the day, the consumer needs to want Atmos for audio manufacturers, movie theaters, film studios, and recording studios to see value in licensing it. And it's in this marketing where things get very fucky. If you go to Dolby's website and experience Atmos, you'll be met with some recognizable songs like Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, where you can listen to it in the Atmos version versus the boring old stereo version. Not only does this absolutely make no sense since you wouldn't have an Atmos system to listen to it on, but most browsers don't have Atmos support. But what's worse is the stereo version you're comparing it to isn't the actual mix you'll find on a streaming service, but instead one with really bad mixing and panning. So to be clear, sonically, neither of the two files are anywhere close to the song that Marvin Gaye or his engineer approved. There's not even an asterisk or hidden text. It's just directly, boldly lying to you. And that's just where the bullshit begins. Once manufacturers get involved, the accountability gets passed around like a hot potato. Atmos is often sold as a speaker stick that projects an immersive bubble of sound over your couch. And then if you buy it and when you don't experience that and you try and troubleshoot it, it's, well, is your TV and HDMI output compatible? Are you using the streaming service that supports Atmos? Does it support it on the device that you're streaming it from? You just need to stop being such a cheapskate and upgrade more stuff. Surely it is one of those things and not the fact that shooting a fucking force field of ghost speakers is physically impossible. But I would be doing myself, and more importantly for the purposes of this video, you a disservice if I didn't try to see if upgrading to a new standard could improve my music listening and home theater quality. My current home theater system in my living room is a mid-grade 5.1 setup that I spent about $800 on over 10 years ago. It's all right. I guess it's time to upgrade and see what I'm missing. I hope that my skepticism is wrong because having a truly mind-bending immersive audio experience in my living room would make me very happy. As with any established pro audio oriented YouTube channel, plenty of companies have offered to send me high-end Atmos systems for review, but I really wanted to approach this as a consumer. So let's set aside everything that I know about immersive audio and try to be as unbiased as possible and just define what it is that I want in my home theater. Do I want to hear music the way that my favorite musicians want me to hear it? That's a big promise, but sure. I also want to hear a super mutant shouting weird shit at me from behind when I'm playing Fallout. I don't really need to hear a helicopter flying overhead in perfect precision, but sure, that would be cool if a movie or television show or game was more immersive. So I did my research. What is the best mid-range Atmos home theater setup I could get for under $1,000? Ideally, closer to $500. The one that kept getting recommended by both consumer tech and even some audiophile resources was the Vizio Elevate series, and even some YouTubers in that space like it. So I managed to get a highly reviewed M-Series 5.1.2 soundbar with 13 speakers, adaptive height satellite speakers, wireless subwoofer, and Atmos and DTSX compatibility for about $700 after tax. So I'm in. Atmos unlocked. It seems like only a fraction of games support Atmos, which is kind of surprising since Wise and FMOD and all of the most popular game engines have options for Atmos integration, so maybe it's just the high licensing fees? I don't know. So I found this Excel spreadsheet that someone on Reddit made of Xbox Atmos compatibility, which is kind of sad that this doesn't already exist from Dolby or Microsoft, but I wanted to play Fallout 76. However, unfortunately, it's not compatible, so I guess No Man's Sky it is and it is one of the few games that is officially confirmed by Dolby and Microsoft to work with Atmos. So even though the sub is smaller and the amp has a lot less power for gaming and watching movies or shows, I feel like it's actually a fair improvement. And I'm certainly not experiencing an immersive bubble or hearing things above or below me, but it seems like the rear satellites are just used more or used more intentionally, which in all honesty could be owed to Dolby's aggressive push to adoption more than the format or technology itself. I feel like that could have been accomplished on the 5.1 system, but it's just that, 5.1 doesn't have any hype behind it, so maybe they're not using it as much anymore. But the bigger problem is that to use Atmos, I had to play a game that I'm not already playing. I had to watch a TV show that I wasn't already watching, and a lot of people will need to upgrade their console or Netflix subscription. Now, music. 
when I listened to stereo music, it only played it on two of my 13 speakers in this 5.1.2 system. And there was seemingly no way to change that other than turning on some older DTS virtual room codec, which just puts shitty reverb on everything. Like I spent all of this money and work to upgrade to a system where I can't use my subwoofer with 99% of available music. And that's after I signed up for a streaming platform that I would otherwise never use. Solely as a consumer, this is very annoying because if I keep this system around and don't return it, then that means that my living room will no longer be used to intentfully listen to music. And again, that hot potato of accountability gets passed around. I don't know if this is Dolby's problem or Amazon Music's problem or Vizio's problem or Microsoft's problem. But overall, when I jumped through all of those hoops and got Atmos working, there's nothing technologically fascinating happening, and there definitely isn't any sound coming from over my head. I did not get that at all. But of course, I did want the overhead effect to work, and I did a lot of nosing through the manual and Googling and trying various settings, but it just wouldn't. And I was under the impression that most, if not all, consumer Atmos systems that use sound reflection had some sort of auto calibration process. This is not the case. This one did not. And it seems like the ones that do have auto calibration are actually not doing that much anyway. So even though I got a 13 speaker system with two satellites and a wireless sub, I didn't experience anything remotely similar to what was promised. When trying to troubleshoot why the overhead reflection wasn't working, my problem was that I don't have a flat ceiling that is around 10 feet tall. So the common solution recommended to people with vaulted or high ceilings would be to buy and install four to six ceiling speakers, which would put me in the $2,000 plus budget. Also, ceiling fans are apparently a no-no, so no more airflow in the living room. And even then, my living room Room is just too broken up. In fact, the only room in my house that would qualify for the minimal layout requirements for any Atmos system with reflective height speakers would be my recording studio. And even then, it's a dead room by design, so the absorption coefficient would be far too high. So in my case, if I go by Dolby's 60 page guide, call a contractor and build a home theater designed for Atmos, then I can hear a helicopter zooming over my head. And you know what? If I were absurdly rich and didn't know that homeless people existed, maybe I would. Now let's take a step back and, I don't know, look at Dolby's own website promising a multi-dimensional listening experience from a fucking eight-inch tall talking cylinder. Experience songs the way artists envisioned. Ah, yes, the thing all musicians aspire to accomplish, being heard on an Amazon Echo. <laughs> I have an Xbox Series X, and it was a little bit time-consuming and confusing to find headphones that clearly supported Atmos with it. So I just went with the default, endorsed by Dolby themselves, and the price, not too bad, $99. So let's just enable the settings we need to enable and get on with it. I wonder if these are volume. That's actually kind of clever. So I have like a seven day trial to be able to use Atmos with these headphones before I have to pay $15 to continue using Atmos with these headphones. This is Dolby Atmos, the world's first object-based cinematic audio. It wasn't. I keep double checking to make sure that I have everything set up right, and I definitely am not getting any sort of surround element when the things are swirling around my head. I can hear some dithering with the codec when it's trying to go behind my head. So I could hear that like some effect is happening, it's just not happening on these Atmos headphones. So I'm running circles around this farting plant and the sound design is actually incredible, but I can't seem to tell the difference if it's behind me or in front of me. Someone recommended that I try the LG T90 earbuds that allegedly support head tracking. They're pricey and they push me a bit out of budget, but if I could experience Atmos from my phone or play with the Dolby mixing tools on my computer or even listen to my ambisonic recordings with full head tracking, that would be great. And the dudes in the LG promo videos look like they're on fucking ayahuasca, so I ordered them. Not having the best luck pairing these. So if I want to watch a movie with Atmos with these headphones using the head tracking, I have to do it from my phone and I'm watching Dune on HBO Max or Max, which supports Atmos. However, it's a stereo mix and my head is tracking with the stereo mix just over here. Okay, so highly touted premium expensive 
Dolby Atmos approved head tracking earbuds. Even after installing the seven day trial of Dolby Atmos on Windows, it doesn't actually give Atmos to the headphones. So I download Amazon Music, which is part of my Prime membership. However, that doesn't include anything with Atmos, so I have to pay extra for Amazon Music Unlimited. Then I go on a little scavenger hunt looking for the few songs that do support Atmos. And in my very subjective opinion, I don't think I liked one mix better than I did the stereo. It seems like in a lot of songs, they just took one element, like the vocals, and then just panned them around your head for no fucking reason at all, apparently. Oh yeah, this brings me back to when I saw Pink Floyd live when Roger Waters just started flying around my head. Then I did something I wish I didn't do. I left Atmos on and I listened to one of my songs, the stereo version in Atmos mode and motherfucker. I'm not gonna lie to you, my first reaction was to like, just pull my music off of the service. I guess I should have taken Dolby's offer and mixed it in Atmos so it would sound like it normally sounds in stereo. And yeah, a $300 headache that felt like having to navigate through a maze to watch a film or listen to music with Atmos. Now, if you're an Apple loyalist and use Apple for everything, then the maze is a little bit easier and more expensive, but the experience at the end of the day, unfortunately, is about the same. Naturally, I tried the AirPods Max and the Apple Music, and the music sounded about identical to my LG experience. And AirPods are top of the line, very decent headphones, by the way, so no complaints there, but you'd never know it if you only listen to Atmos mixes or object-oriented audio forced back into stereo because it sounds like dog shit. And listen, I know that I am being very brutal here, but I am being 100% honest about my experience. And maybe this is why. If a bias is poking out here, it's because as a musician, I've released dozens of albums across all sorts of formats and labels, and not one of them was engineered or mastered by anyone else. I've never hired or even allowed somebody else to master my music, even when mastering to vinyl plate. I am that much of an anal retentive control freak when it comes to my own content. So it's likely that any manipulation to my mix, or even a mix of a classic song that I'm familiar with will be met with ferocity. On the road to Atmos, every single step of the way, you need to spend more money on something. It is choke point capitalism at its finest. Dolby is spending a huge amount of capital to make it the new standard. And if you're a musician, you are expected to shell out a whole bunch of your own money to upgrade your whole setup to meet that standard. And any software or hardware with so much as an Atmos logo on it has to cough up money to Dolby. You have to license their software and you have to switch your workflow to work with their partners or licensees. Consumer electronics companies have to pay a set royalty for every individual unit or device that they sell that includes any mention of Atmos, and that cost gets passed on to the listener or customer. I wanna wrap this up with a possibly rhetorical question. If Atmos were an open format or an open standard, meaning that there were no licensing fees and it existed like one of the open source ambisonic encoders, meaning that it would cost much less for musicians to adopt, for manufacturers to use and customize, and for customers to consume. So if Atmos existed as that open technological standard with no profit margin, with no marketing budget, do you think that you would have or even want that level of immersive audio in your living room? And it's not like this is anywhere close to the first or last time that something will be forcefully jammed into consumer electronics. In my opinion, Atmos for Music is a solution without a problem. Music is something that is strongly connected to nostalgia, which is why so many people still collect vinyl records. The best or proper way to listen to your favorite artist or your favorite album is defined by you, not the artist, and certainly not a multi-billion dollar conglomerate. All of this is worth carefully considering before you spend a ton of money to upgrade your home studio or your home theater, or before you feel bad that you can't afford to join the Atmos Club. Every single Atmos for Music mix that I heard turned a good song into a tech gimmick. All right, that's enough. Sorry if this sounded too ranty. I hope it was helpful to somebody. By the way, this channel is officially a nonprofit organization, and if you found this video educational or entertaining, or if you think you'd benefit from a healthy community of like-minded musicians or creative techie folks, and if you'd like to participate in a well-organized monthly songwriting challenge every single month, and if you want to support this type of content in general, you can join my Patreon for as little as $1. Thanks for watching. Keep creating. Bye.